Hi, I'm Dr. Larry Malerba, and welcome back to All Things Homeopathy. This is part two of my discussion on homeopathic dosing. In part one, I talked about potency selection. Today, I'll be discussing remedy administration and repetition. So let's not waste time, let's jump right in. Okay, now once we've decided on potency, the next question becomes, when and how frequently to administer a remedy. So let's talk about some guidelines for the administration of remedies. As previously noted, the rules are quite different for acute and chronic illnesses. Generally speaking, it's more appropriate to repeat doses for acute conditions because acutes often give us less time to work with. Therefore, we adjust the timing and frequency of dosing according to the intensity or severity of the problem. We repeat doses more quickly in order to manage our time well and in order to ensure the safety of the patient. Chronic cases tend to be less urgent and that usually gives us more time to work with. Therefore, it's more reasonable to give a dose or two of a remedy and then wait several weeks or even months before reevaluating a chronic case. Allow me to demonstrate with a couple examples of acute prescribing. Person A has flu-like symptoms with headache, muscle aches, and runny nose. Person B has flu-like symptoms with high fever, vomiting, and inability to keep fluids down. In the first case, I might prescribe two or three doses of a 30C to be taken over a 24-hour period with instructions to report back after 48 hours. If there's no improvement, then another remedy can be tried in a similar manner. Since the second case is more urgent because it carries with it the risk of dehydration, I might prescribe three or four doses of a 30C to be taken over an eight to 12 hour period with instructions to call back that same evening or the next morning with a progress report. So in case B, we administer doses more rapidly and stand ready to change the remedy sooner if the patient is not showing signs of improvement. Let's try another example. <clears throat> Person A falls and lands on his arm, resulting in moderate bruising. Person B slams his thumb in a car door resulting in potentially serious injury. In the first case, I might recommend two or three doses of Arnica 30C with each dose to be taken an hour apart. The second case requires much more immediate action. I would instruct the patient to take a dose of Arnica 30C every three minutes for three doses, then three more doses five minutes apart, then three more doses 15 minutes apart. And all of this should be done while traveling to and waiting to be seen at the nearest emergency facility. Here you see how we must tailor the dosing according to the urgency of the problem. Now another rule of thumb is that lower potencies bear repetition better than higher potencies. This allows us to repeat a low potency in a case of organic pathology in the hope of encouraging slow, steady improvement while minimizing the risk of aggravation. For example, I might prescribe a low dose of Heclalava, perhaps a 6X, for a bony growth on the hand to be taken once every four days over the course of a few weeks. Higher potencies for more functional and or psychological problems must be given much more time between doses in order to assess their action over the course of weeks and months. The need to wait is of paramount importance in most chronic cases. Once again, when it comes to homeopathy, more is usually not better. Giving doses more frequently or ascending too quickly through a range of potencies without giving adequate time to assess the progress of the patient tends to yield poor results. 
As far as the timing of doses, whether one takes a dose, for example, in the morning or at bedtime or before dinner, tends to be far less important than the overall frequency of dosing. In most cases, timing makes little difference. The one exception might be when treating extremely sensitive patients. It may be best to consult such patients in order to assist you in your decision making. As a general rule, when dealing with chronic cases where a remedy appears to be working well, it's best not to repeat the remedy until the benefits begin to wear off. I've created this chart to illustrate my point. A remedy is given here on day one. We then see general progress over the course of the first 10 days, resulting in approximately 40% overall improvement. Progress then plateaus out over the following 10 days with a short dip in the middle at about day 15. That short dip in progress does not justify repetition of the remedy. It's important to wait because many patients will report periods of progress followed by plateaus or mild setbacks, only to then recover and go on to experience further progress without ever repeating the remedy. However, when symptoms do begin to return or to worsen and the patient appears to be on the decline, then it may be time to repeat the remedy. We see this beginning to occur here between days 20 and 25. This could justify repeating the remedy around day 25, but then again, it would also be reasonable to wait another five to 10 days just to be sure that the vital force is not going to recover on its own without the help of another dose. When it becomes clear that improvement is trending downward, that is often the best time to repeat a remedy. Of course, there are many other factors to take into consideration. For example, when progress does take place, sometimes the symptom picture begins to shift and change. Sometimes that can warrant a change to a different remedy. Case management decisions of this nature represent a more complex topic, one that is beyond the scope of our posology discussion and one that would require far more time to explore. A common mistake can be made when a remedy brings a certain degree of symptomatic relief, but then wears off. Subsequent doses also bring relief but they do so for progressively shorter periods of time. When this happens, it's easy to conclude that either the remedy should be repeated again or that the potency must be increased. Now, sometimes this is true, but most of the time it's not. It depends upon how we define relief and how long the relief lasts. If there was improvement in a few targeted symptoms, but not in the person's overall health or sense of well-being, then we must suspect that the remedy was acting palliatively. In other words, it may have been a partially correct remedy, but did not cover the overall case as a whole. Here we have an example of a homeopathic remedy being used as if it's an allopathic drug. I've had new patients tell me, for example, that they've been taking some remedy on an as-needed basis for sleep problems, sometimes for months. I explained to them that if it had been the correct remedy, it would have been enough to cure their sleep problems 10 times over. This illustrates how remedies can be used inappropriately to forcibly suppress symptoms in the same way that allopathic drugs are used. And just like with allopathic drugs, repeated doses of a palliative homeopathic remedy can wind up suppressing symptoms. And suppressive measures often lead to more serious longer-term health problems. The bottom line is that if repeated doses of a remedy produce increasingly diminished returns, it is no longer the correct remedy or may not have been the correct remedy to begin with. Now, sometimes it's advisable to repeat remedies on a regular basis 
in order to produce a slow, gentle, and gradual healing response. As previously noted, this is particularly desirable when dealing with organic pathology or with individuals who are in fragile, weakened states of health. The LM or Q potencies may be particularly helpful in such situations. The key difference in this potency scale is that the strength of the remedy is slightly altered with each successive dose. Properly done, this method requires more patient education and professional supervision. This brings me to my final point, which is that debates within the homeopathic world regarding posology often serve as a distraction from a more important underlying issue. In my opinion, stressing over the ideal potency or the best way to administer remedies often serves as an excuse for poor prescribing. It's an excuse for the fact that we simply haven't found the best remedy for the case. In this sense, it's easier to blame the potency than to blame our own case taking and analysis skills or our limited knowledge of Materia Medica. Let's face it, homeopathy is a vast field of knowledge and it takes a great deal of experience to learn how to become a competent practitioner. Even the most experienced homeopaths make incorrect decisions. Believe me, I've made plenty of mistakes myself. When someone becomes fixated on the idea that a remedy is not working because it hasn't been administered in the correct manner, then there's a high likelihood that it's just not the right remedy. In my experience, the correct remedy will show signs of working no matter how it's administered and regardless of the potency used. Focusing on posology shouldn't become a distraction from the bigger concern, which is our knowledge of Materia Medica and our ability to choose the correct remedy. Guidelines regarding posology simply serve to fine tune our use of the correct remedy for different problems in different situations. Now, in my opinion, certain aspects of homeopathic posology are more important than others. The following is my list of prescribing factors in order of importance. The first most important factor in homeopathic posology is the choice of remedy. The wrong remedy isn't going to solve the problem, no matter how you administer it. The next most important factor is the frequency with which a remedy is administered. More frequent dosing is not necessarily a good thing. In fact, doing so can disrupt a case that had already been showing signs of progress. Third in order of importance is the potency of the remedy. The correct remedy will produce signs of improvement no matter what potency is used. And the least important factor is the form in which a remedy is administered. Whether a remedy is taken in solid or liquid form is a comparatively minor consideration that makes little difference in the vast majority of cases. Okay, now allow me to finish by briefly summarizing some of the key points from both parts one and two of homeopathic dosing. Number one, homeopathy is a stimulus response form of medicine. Two, the rules for homeopathic prescribing, therefore, are completely different from those of allopathic prescribing. Three, the ideal is the single remedy given in the minimum dose necessary to stimulate healing. Number four, it is not advisable to mix remedies or to give combinations of remedies, except in unusual circumstances. Five, stronger or more frequent doses are not necessarily better. Six, it is critically important to be patient when prescribing and to allow time for a remedy to work. Seven, the specific choice of remedy given is the most important factor of all. Number eight, 30X and 30C are ideal potencies that can be useful 
in a wide variety of situations. Nine, it is reasonable to use lower potencies when treating organic pathology. 10, lower potencies can be given more frequently in cases of organic pathology. 11, higher potencies can be useful in cases of deeper mental emotional pathology. Number 12, more frequent dosing is warranted when managing the time constraints of acute conditions. 13, most chronic conditions should be treated with infrequent dosing at longer intervals. 14. When we're uncertain about our remedy choice, it's best to stick with a lower potency. 15. Higher potencies should be reserved for when we are more certain of our remedy choice. 16. It's preferable to use lower potencies when treating sensitive individuals. 17. It's similarly preferable to use lower potencies when treating those in weakened or compromised states of health. 18. If a higher potency is needed, it's preferable to ascend gradually through a potency scale. Number 19. Lower potencies bear repetition better than higher potencies. 20. Higher potencies and more frequent repetitions are more likely to produce an aggravation of symptoms. 21. It's best not to repeat a remedy unless or until it shows signs of wearing off. 22. Inappropriate repetition of remedies can result in suppression of symptoms. And 23. Finally, when in doubt, reevaluate the situation in order to determine if the best remedy has been chosen for the case. Okay, I hope you found this helpful. And posology is a big topic, and I could go on for days, but I won't. Don't forget to subscribe and please tune in again to All Things Homeopathy. May the vital force be with you. Mm -hmm.